Oh, you man. should just start a recording and just left it absolutely blank <laughs> for 30 minutes. Just us, no swearing, trim. just us swearing at the computer. Just like, what are we doing? I like it. <laughs> what, are we, what are we going for at, at 8 o'clock start? We spent 35 minutes just trying to work out how to unmute each other. Oh, man. I'm new to this podcast game. You, hey, might, you, not, you might not you think so. You through. <laughs> What did the phone? What did the phone say when you um, were holding it up? I couldn't see I it. Didn't, I didn't think you would be able to, but it said it was. It said the host will not let you un. <laughs> <laughs> the host has no idea what he's doing. Oh man, that's pretty funny. This is this is Don's first time on Zoom. <laughs> well, just think about the first time we did a podcast and how bad that went. <laughs> At least I haven't disappointed the second time. <laughs> I was 45 minutes later. <laughs> wait, wait, why do you say it's recording now? <laughs> I think it is recording now, isn't it? <laughs> Brother, I'm not missing a thing after yeah, the... I'm saying, I'm saying at, the, at the end of that first chat we did. Oh, man, yeah. It's like, oh, that was soul crushing. That could have been my podcast career just done and dusted just then. Oh, but you pushed through. Imagine if we got to the bottom of some real... Oh, we did get to the bottom of a few real important topics, but... Just to have it all fade away. Dude, that's like the biggest, like, honestly, you have one job. You just press this, like, the go button and I, and I messed it up. But, hey, we're here now. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> We've made it full circle back to me not being able to unmute someone. But uh, what's been happening? I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit biased, though, because I'm like, oh, just work Zoom, but I've never... I've never been a leader in Zoom, so I always just get sent links, and I'm like, simple, so. <laughs> so you just, you just threw the gauntlet out to me. So I don't understand your struggle. <laughs> yeah, this is actually my first hosted Zoom party. I've been the same. So I'm, um, I had to do a thing with like MTV a, a while ago, and they're like, oh, yeah, we just hop on Zoom. And I just, I don't know, I just thought like it would, they would sit like, they would message me and be like, hey, you ready to jump on a Zoom thing? But they emailed me a link and it was like with a time and everything. And it was like probably 20 minutes after I was supposed to be on the Zoom chat. And they're like, are you joining? And I was like, oh shit, that's now. And I had no idea what to do. And they're like, I don't even think I had a Zoom account. Like I need to sign up for everything. And she's like, the lady's super nice. But she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. Just to help me. <laughs> I was like, I just work here. I thought it was just like Facebook, like FaceTime. Like she'll just call me on Zoom and I'll answer. But it's like, no, you've got to have a Zoom yeah, account. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I'm out of the loop, lady. I just, yeah, I ride down hills. But There's too many going around too, because then you have like Google Meetup and like Microsoft Teams, and then every single one is like a completely different monster you got to tackle. Well, yeah. If you, I don't even know about those things. That's how out of the loop I am. I like, is this, this is free, I'm pretty sure, but they're trying to charge you for like, they're probably just trying to charge you for things and like not being able to mute people. So then all the people that just get real angry and just like start hitting the computer is like, okay, we'll just pay $10 a month and we won't mute anyone ever. The only thing I don't know if, I remember that they used to have a time limit on these Zooms and I don't know if that's still a thing or not. Oh, really? Like without having like premium account. We're probably, we're probably going to find out halfway through this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if, we cut, if we cut out at any point, if we just have a little thing come up, like you have 10 minutes to go, I'm like, oh shit, Charlie, hit the, hit the heavy points now. <laughs> it's a real casual conversation. What are those up. trophies you got behind you? Um, they're actually, they're CJs. I'm in his office currently. So I think. Right. What are they? Uh, the motocross trophies actually i think one i think one b grade he actually he got a medal for um for seventh in an overall <laughs> and, I'm just, <laughs> and i'm just like and it was in b grade i think as well i'm like oh that's just i feel like that just sums up like the society we live in now where i'm like oh every, hey, everyone wins oh dude exactly which like i, I i'm all for like giving someone like a bit of a pat on the back but at the same time like, go get, go get your money. Like, you need to earn that. <laughs> Dude, I swam a, like a swimming race when I was like in year six at school, like a primary school. And I fully got dead last. Like, I am not built to swim. Like, kids that were, I would say were not over, like, they were pretty big. Like, they were big kids and they still, like, they hose me. Like, I just can't swim for some reason. 
and I got a medal, like a little ribbon at the end. It just said, you swam a race. I didn't have a position. I didn't even have a position. That's just like, it was almost a, like a fuck you in a way. It was just like, you suck, but we'll still give you something to just, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like a blue ribbon as well. So it was the same color as first, but it was just like the other end of the spectrum. Oh, but damn, I swam that race, man. <laughs> They're like, we're giving you this because we have to. Yeah, we've got it. <laughs> the the uh, parent union all cut, put together, pulled together, and uh, they pushed for that. <laughs> you just know, you know like mums on the side of the pool, like, my son deserves something. <laughs> I don't. I suck. You will, you will give him something today. <laughs> right now. Right now. Uh, it's funny. I wonder if we're like, you know how you see those like real pushy parents? And you're just like, yeah. oh, I'd never be that parent. But I'm like, you don't have a kid though. It's like, as, as soon as you get a kid, you're just like, you will do everything and just like go gnarly, gnarly, gnarly into it. But How's yeah. your, uh, how's your setup feeling? That's pretty gnarly. Yeah. It's real burly. Hey, cause they can do, um, they can do keyhole surgery, but my doctor, I think he's a bit old school. And the other thing with it is like when they do keyhole, it's like, obviously they have a little camera that goes through and they like slice it back. But I think it's like, it'd be, I don't know, I'm just kind of, I think I'm just telling myself this as well, but I kind of feel like there's some logic to it. Like when, when they cut it, man, like they open my hand like right up and they've got like, like full, like what look like pliers and like, just cut, like it was hard. Like it, I could feel like it hard to cut. Cause it's like these ligaments that go across. So I was like, I was awake, just like had my head turned and I thought they were cutting the stitch. Really? Yeah. So I was like laying there and I could hear this like cutting and I thought they were like just cutting the stitches. So I was like, Oh sweet. They must be done. So I like turned over, looked my hands like fully spread open like that. And the guy's cutting the ligaments and it just sounded like, imagine like as you know, he cut a zip tie. It's just like, and then like snaps. Yeah. It, it was just like that. And I was just like, okay, that's enough of that. And then just turned back away and just went back, back, went back into my, yeah. It was pretty nice. Yeah, it looks good though. It's like not even swollen or anything. Nah, dude, I've been like fully, fully rehabbing properly this time around. Like even coming into it, I'm like, this is like, I'm just going to eat good food, rest. It's been actually making me super tired, but I just like, as soon as I get real tired, man, I'll just sleep. Yeah. yeah. And recover. I feel like too, like when, when you get an injury, your body just makes you so tired because it's just trying to focus all its energy on healing that. Yeah. Plus sure. two, you're just like laying around, not doing a whole lot anyways, but. Yeah. It kind of builds into that, but. It's been, it's been good, man. It's been like, I guess the best injury I've kind of gone into. Cause I think even going into it, man, I was like, cause it was like self-inflicted. Obviously like I chose to get it done. So I think that's like, you have a different mindset going in. It's not like you're at a race and you crash and hurt yeah, yourself. Yeah, it's not like you, you messed up and like, you're like questioning your riding or whatever. Yeah. You're not, yeah. It's not like, yeah, you don't, you don't think of like, Oh, what could I have done better? It's like, no, I want to do this for the right reasons. So what's the uh, recovery process for that? Um, they reckon four, four to six weeks, but I think they just like, that's such a, a doctor thing. Just like, it's just any doctor's oh, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I feel like you're for an athlete, just easily chop at least a week off. Yeah. I think chop a week off. And then plus like, even when I went to the, okay, so I got it done and um, I just said to him, cause they, they want to like, they just prescribe you painkillers like anyone kind of does after you get surgery yeah, or an yeah. injury. And I said to them, I'm like, oh, I don't really want to take um, really strong painkillers because it just gives me nightmares, runs me down, like makes you constipated, does all this bad stuff. And I was like, do you have it? Like, what do you have another option? And they're like, Oh, maybe just don't take as much. Like maybe just take one instead of two or something. And I'm like that, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't solve the problem. It just like, yeah. m m like brings it down a little bit. And I didn't take any, I just took like some just standard Patadol and that was it. But it hurt really bad the first night, but then the second day, like bearable for sure. But I'm, when I broke my heel, I was on a lot and I just didn't, yeah, didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, if, if you, I just the same when I did my wrist last year, like even during the operation, I was like, don't give me any opiates or mm. anything. Like I just did it without any like proper drugs and it was, it was okay. Yeah. And just, yeah, you kind of, obviously the pain when it happens is pretty gnarly, but then it, it goes, I think it gives your body a chance to actually deal with that pain. And I think people, that's the whole point. They try and mask it with all these painkillers and they're not actually, yeah. their body's yeah. trying to, it kind of, it's just, I feel like it just freaking your body out more than it needs to 
like it's just going through a panic and then obviously you got pain and then you got all these other drugs inside. It's just trying, it doesn't know where to focus the energy of like healing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just like system overload. Mm, yeah, exactly. And I think, um, yeah, hundred percent system overload. And then just the fact that it's just like, I think you should deal with the pain. Like you should actually like, that's what that one thing, even with the surgery being awake for it and like going through it, I was like, really wanted to be like well what's this going to be like and how's my body going to react to it and then try and even calm myself down like when they first started cutting like the, my hand open like I was fully awake for it and they were telling me what they were doing and my body went into like kind of a shock because it's like obviously your body doesn't like to get cut open so like heart started racing a bit started like breathing got a bit heavier and then I was like try to pull myself back out of that and then calm myself down which I, I was able to do at the end but I was like people don't want to experience like that pain or that stress so they just, they obviously go get knocked out, they wake up and then they take a heap of drugs and like their body doesn't actually get to process any of that, that process at all. Like they just, it's all kind of hiding from pain and discomfort the whole way through. And I was just like, more or less, I want to go through it and actually see how I react to it. And obviously it's going to be a panic at some point, but then if you can deal with that, I'm like, well, fuck you, you're better off for it. Yeah, for sure. So was that your main motivation to not getting knocked out for it? Dude, I was, it was, there's, there's actually a lot of factors. Hey, like it was a lot quicker to do it. So it was in and out half an hour for a surgery is pretty. Oh, sick. So quicker to do it. It was a lot cheaper because obviously I don't have the overhead hospital fees. Um, and just the fact that I just wanted to see if like I could, I could do it really. Like it was just one of those things and the time frame as well to try and get into a hospital at the moment. It's kind of tricky with the whole COVID and everything and everything's, I don't know, it's just, it's just harder than it should be kind of thing. So sure. And we obviously only have a small window. So I was just like, yep, let's get it done in and out. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy now. It's going to be interesting getting it because I get this one done in like a week's time. So I think I'm going to almost want to watch this more, like to see how it's done. Because I looked at a little bit of this and then I was like, nah, I'm out. But now I'm just like, fuck, imagine we're just watching the whole thing, like the whole process. Sure. But how's but your, I reckon, how I mean, surely your right one will be pretty solid by the time you do the, the left. So yeah. like it shouldn't feel like I would assume that you're not going to be like sitting there like with two useless hands, you know? Nah, I mean? nah, nah. Even now, man, I'm so surprised. I've been like, like I said, just rehabbing it properly and like, like stretching it, mobility. Um, even do you know you know what a tens machine is like the little um yeah like yeah electric shock. So I've had that on it. That's helped a heap as well. Um, just just heaps of stuff like that. Even just like hot cold treatment. Just everything I can possibly do to try and like hurry it up. Yeah, I think a plus two, like, I feel like with injuries these days, like, me personally, the last, like, my hand and my wrist last year, I was just, like, like emphasizing, I'm like, can we please not cast it? Like, give me a splint, but, like, at least mm. give me the opportunity to, like, move it. And, like, I felt like that it was so huge, like, because you don't have to deal with the muscle atrophy. And then, like, plus, there's such less um, time for all the scar tissue to build up. Like, just yeah. being able to slightly move it like obviously not overuse it, but use it enough to where like you can keep it somewhat mobile. And um, I feel like that's been huge. And then plus two, like it's been, I feel like just like not sitting there and like doing nothing with an injury, like still getting out and like just getting that blood flowing. Has, yeah. Like I feel like it speeds it up so quickly. Well, do you feel like just say when you've got any sort of injury and you go for a ride or do like a gym workout, that doesn't obviously impact the injury you'll come out of that and you'll be like i feel like i've had an extra day of healing like you just get a, an overwhelming amount of movement back in it oh for sure and then even like with my wrist last year like i was like i literally i went for a road ride like the day after surgery like with this massive yeah. like cast thing on it but like just like all those little vibrations like are so good for it mm yeah it just yeah it just stabilizes it all and all because that's the biggest thing man like people will injure themselves and even just say with my wrist or your wrist you put it in a cast every one of those little muscles that support the bone around your hand will just deteriorate like if they're not you, you yeah. don't use it you lose it and that's like then you're trying to like what's what like you're dealing with obviously a cracked bone or something but then you're dealing with all the muscles and tendons and For everything sure. that have just got weak as well so it's like yeah, you're, yeah it's like instead of one one issue you get 12 or whatever you know like how however many tendons and ligaments there are surrounding it like it mm. just makes the obviously like if you have a snap leg like you you got to cast it but i've been yeah. super i've felt very blessed that i didn't have to 
get like a full cast for the last two injuries. Did you kind of push that for your doctors or did they, were they more open to the idea? Uh, with my wrist, it was pretty much from the start. Um, because I think mainly with the wrist, it was because the pin was in there. So, you know, like essentially like right out of surgery, like the, the bone's not healed, but it's strong. You know what yeah. I mean? So the, the splint was, that's kind of why we went the route for that. Um, and then the hand, um, I think it was kind of the same thing where um, my doctor just, he, he wanted to, for me to be able to move my hand. Like he really was like, we, we can't get the scar tissue to build up. Like you got to move your hand and make sure you keep working on the mobility. So that way we don't make a bigger problem. Yeah. That's good though, that like they obviously push for that. Cause some doctors, like I'm learning more and more that like you obviously, you know, as a kid, you like look at a doctor as like they know best for me kind of thing. And their words mm. kind of like gospel. And now you kind of, you step back a little bit and you go, Hey, wait a minute. Like that doesn't, that doesn't add up in a certain way. Yeah, I, for sure. It's crazy too. Like even with my wrist, um, cause obviously my mom's an ER nurse. So she, the, the hand and wrist specialist that I go to now, she used to work with him. And even when I did my wrist, she was like, right, we got to go see Dr. Franklin. Like he's, he's the man. Um, mm. So I went to him when I did my wrist, but he was leaving for town the next day for surge or for a uh, vacation. So I had another guy do the surgery and he was like exactly what you were talking about. Like he had no perspective for an athlete. Um, like every single time I would go back to him for a checkup, he would like add weeks. Like I'd be like, okay, like you said four weeks ago, um, you know, that I could get on the bike in, in six weeks total. And then he'd be, you know, I'd go and see him and then it would be four weeks and he'd be like, Oh, uh, another three weeks, like you can get back on it. So it was so frustrating. Like he, he had no urgency to get me back on the bike. Mm -hmm. So the, the doctor that I go to now is actually the one that essentially he didn't do the surgery for my wrist, but like, I just started going to him for like, you know, all the checkups and like, he essentially treated me as far as recovery. Um, following it and then yeah. um he's the one that obviously it, i i went to for my hand um but yeah he's super cool he watches the races like he's he's super stoked on it so it's it's definitely a blessing to have someone that gets it because I, yeah. I just like you said like so many doctors can just be like well six weeks like that's you know you're not doing anything type thing yeah. um versus someone that actually gets your position and it's like understands that you have to keep training and you got to stay healthy and basically try it. Let's see what, what we can get away with while obviously still properly recovering. Yeah, exactly. And that's like, he, he sees the process you can go through. He knows how quick you could do it. He knows why you need to do it. He's not just like, Oh, you yeah. had surgery rest for this time. Here's some drugs to mask the pain. Good luck. Like it's such a cookie yeah. cut, cutter process to go through. And I'm just like, even after this, I look at it now and just say I got this back when I was 20, like just say I had this done. I, w I would do that. I would sit on the couch. I'd probably he eat a heap of painkillers and just wait for it to heal. When now I'm just like, even like food, such a crucial thing to build that back up. Like just putting good food mm. into your body, it's like sleep, obviously huge as well. Like keeping blood flow, like using a TENS machine, using mobility, like so many different things, going in like a, a float tank or something like that, like putting magnesium, like there's so many things. And I used to be under the, like the idea of like, you get an injury. I'm like, oh, well, you just got to wait. Like it's just. You're yeah, just yeah, yeah. Like, oh, you're, you're hurt. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. We've got six weeks. That's what the doctor said. Doctors are right because they know more than me. And I guess, yeah, what, <laughs> it's, it's nice to actually know we're actually <laughs> learning something, but like why yeah that's what i look at for young kids kind of coming up now it's just like they get told these things by people they look at as being smarter than them and then it's just like their words kind of like yeah like gospel and they just follow it and it's just it's kind of shit in a way now that it's just like even the doctor i had like he's quite he's quite an old doctor which most of them are because obviously it takes such a long process to become a doctor in the first place um but yeah there's not that many that are like i guess having techniques that are actually like viable now and like new processes and like a holistic approach to actually healing so for sure yeah i mean even with with my doctor um like when i went to him like i flew home went straight to him the next morning and he was like straight up told me he was like i don't want to do surgery on this like every time i've done surgery on this injury uh 
it's ended up them having a ton of mobility issues because of the scar tissue buildup. So he was mm. like, let's just, let's just put a splint. That way you can still work on your mobility, take it out a bit at home and, and move it. But, um, and that's like, I feel like that's such a good perspective. Like he gets it. Cause you know, another doctor could have been like, Oh, you're, you know, like your, your bones snapped. Like we're, we're doing surgery on this for sure. And then mm. just thrown in a cast and, and that's that. Yeah. And it's such a, like a crucial thing. Cause like you are your own business. Like you are, you are every, like you, you make up everything in your health and your body's like the, the product. So it's like you, it's your biggest mm. pro- product and you just can't go to any, any which person or whatever and just be like, yep, deal with, <laughs> deal with my whole future with, with, yeah, cut me open and moving around stuff that you probably shouldn't. But how, yeah, how, how is, sure. how is your risk going now? Cause I saw you like you're riding again now, but you just got a brace. Yeah. T- today was, uh, well, so I, I didn't actually wear a brace on my right hand, which is what's broken. Um, oh, really? But yeah, today, today was my first ride and it felt awesome. So I'm super psyched. It felt so good to like, I was like getting my bike ready last night and like wake <laughs> up, do mobility. I was like, yeah, let's go. And it was sick. Cause it rained this last week again for the first time forever. So like first ride back got like really good conditions and um, yeah. yeah, I'm stoked. So is this the first so ride? I, I, What's that? Is this your first ride from before World Champs? Yeah. 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 I haven't been on a bike since I flew home. Yeah. And now is are you just like, is this is this go time now for Chuckles? Are we back are we back into it? Yeah, yeah. I uh Chris just sent me a the first program for the year oh, on sick. Sunday. So yeah, how does, it feels good. How does that work with Chris? Because you guys are obviously working together for two years now, three years. Three. Three, really, yeah. So you've been working, so we just, he just... 18, 19, yeah, we're going into our fourth year. Damn, nice. So he just, what is, what's the process of that? Like, he'll kind of obviously get on, like, calls with you and stuff and be like, okay, this is the start date, and then you start building from there, or do you kind of, like, obviously work alongside him to be like, I feel like I want to start going now, or, like, how does that all kind of work? Yeah, I, I he's really good with, like, he really gets that, um you know to be successful you need to adapt so it's not like it's not just like a cookie cutter where he's like right like this is the date we're starting you're doing this 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 like it's all like a a big collaborative effort and um I mean I've been on phone calls with him quite a bit since I've been home um and we've just been bouncing ideas back and forth about uh you know what what we think is the best idea um relaying to him what the doctor is saying that sort of thing um you know letting him know when I want to get back on the downhill bike. And, um, you know, basically it's kind of, I would say like a lot of it is working backwards, you know, like we have these end goals and you kind of, you know what you're looking for. And then you're like, right, like, let's look, you know, you have the goal and then you're like, right, we need to start here. So it's like kind of like almost working backwards, but but in a sense, you're not obviously because you're starting here and you're looking forward. Um, Yeah. But he is, uh, big shout out to him because he's uh he's very good at understanding all of his athletes um and knowing that you know we're all different people he knows what i need to do to be happy um and in a good mindset you know um making sure i have time to go surf and and just chill out and do that sort of thing um so that way i can you know do the do my job as best as i can um Mm. but yeah he's he's really good at understanding me and um at the end of the day i mean i, I trust him with yeah. everything so it's it's really cool to not have to second guess um and uh but we i mean he's he's so good like i said with asking us what we want and um you know seeing what, how we're feeling and that sort of thing um but yeah so obviously he lives in france so he's sending me all my programs uh, um online um so I do all that, and then he always comes out in the winter, and we do like a a big boot camp type thing. Um, and then obviously he's at all the races. So even though he's um, sending me my programs online, it definitely doesn't feel like that. And um, since we've obviously too, since we've worked together for quite a bit now, we really get each other. And um, and uh, well, I think that's the biggest you know, thing. Everything... With like... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say I think that's such a crucial thing with a coach. It's almost like 
the, I don't know that all the, all the programming and everything is like obviously important to it. But if you don't have like a good connection with someone or you don't trust that person or you can't read someone, cause that's the thing he should be able to read. If you're a good coach, you can read the athletes. Cause like you can see when you need to push them, when you need to step back, when you need to let them find their mm. feet and all that. And that's something I see with Chris and obviously mo- I, I see obviously with you more obvious cause I, I'm with you both together most of the time but has that good connection knows when to come in knows when to step back kind of thing and that's I think that's something that you can't you can't you can't really teach it you've just got to live it in a certain sense and you've got to just have really good people skills and I see that with like you two together like obviously you said you've got all this trust in him and you can just take a massive weight off your shoulders about what you think you have to do because you trust someone that will tell you this is what you have to do and then go forward to do it yeah for sure and um I'm, I'm pretty self-motivated too. So it's not like he has to, you know, like keep track of me, make sure I'm doing my stuff. Like when he sends me the program, like he knows it's going to get done. Um, but I think too, it's huge because it's, it's not just a, a coach athlete relationship. Like he's one of my best friends and um, I'm, you know, super, super open with him about everything that's going on. So it's, it's way more um, of a deeper level than just, you know, sending a program. Here you go. Plus two, I think it's crucial that, he's such a good bike rider because he really understands everything that's going in. Like he knows what our bodies are going through because he rides a bike and he does it very well. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he's at every world cup. He knows everything that goes into putting in a good, uh, you know, final race run. Um, So Mm -hmm. he he really understands all of the, the aspects uh, of being an athlete that come together to, you know, trying to put good race runs together. Well, that's one of the things I always felt because I've been like, I've got um, trained by a lot of, I guess, different people or got advice from certain people, but it's hard to, it's hard to believe someone or take a lot from someone that's never done it. Like you can go and you might be getting trained by someone that knows a hell of a lot about fitness and like is a, as an awesome coach in their own right, but they've never raced a downhill bike. They've never been in that setting. So I'm like, it's hard to, I guess, believe, not believe, but, um, take what they're saying is like the right thing when I'm like, you haven't done it. And it's just that whole thing. It's easy to lead by example. And obviously he's, he's a really good rider. He's, he's raced before he gets the whole, the setting and he knows where your head would be at and what you need to push and where you need to pull back and whatnot. So I definitely see the benefit of that. For sure. And it's, it's awesome too that, I mean, he's my uh, riding coach as well. So there's, there's like at, at the world cups, you know, he's helping me with lines and I, I completely trust him with all the lines and, even going back to, you know, him being such a good bike rider, like he gets like, you know, if there's a, 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 a sketchy, um, like for example, that gap at the bottom of St. Anne, like, mm. you know, us talking about if I should do it or not, like it comes into consideration, like, are you gonna be able to consistently do this at the bottom of a four minute sprint? Like, and he gets it, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Whereas other people can just be like, yo, you're doing this because yeah, this it's is faster. the gap. And like, I've seen a few people hit it faster, but it's like, if you, if you, have, <laughs> you if you, you take see. the, con- the con- if you take the consideration of, you know, doing it consistently at, at the bottom of your race, yeah. I'm like, are you going to be able to do it better? Where was Chris for me? He didn't tell me not to do it. And I just got tomahawks. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm talking about Greg's gap. I, oh, I, I okay. Tried the Dom gap. Oh, that thing. Oh, man. I should have been like, Chris, should I do this? Like, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> Arms will be fine. <laughs> it's easy. Oh, man. Yeah, oh, yeah that was a good race run send you had. Dude, I was going for it. I was like, nah, we're, 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 you know, I did that. I, the run, okay. That morning at worlds, my first run, I felt pretty good. And then the second run, I was just like, you know, when you're just on one, like you just, everything starts to click. Yeah. yeah. And it, it probably fucked me up because like I went down after you do like Steve Smith roller down that straight and I caught someone. So I stopped and yeah. I, was, I was, I was feeling really good. I was probably just going to do a full run. Anyway, I stopped um and then like obviously waited for some people to go and then obviously freshened up so my hands were fresh and just i just felt good so i just went down through the next bit where that gap was and because I, I just felt fresh and really good i just you know when you just kind of do stuff unintentionally but it just feels right yeah, yeah. so I, I, I like i pulled yeah. i pulled it and that like and just nailed it and i was just like well that's a, like it, it's definitely quicker like i reckon you could almost pull a second back because you don't have to do the double yeah you just gain speed so i did yeah, it and i was yeah. just and then I was just playing in my head. I was like, well, if I did, if I've done it once, I can do it twice. So I went for it. But to be honest, the first time in 2015, um, didn't pull the gap all week, not once. And then in my race run, I nailed it. And I was just like, can we, can we, can we do that again? 
That's good. I thought I didn't know you did it in practice. I thought you just I thought you went for it the first time in finals. No, nah, no. Nah, I've actually got a video. Someone filmed me um in my last practice run and I just like I grease it and I was just like okay, well, we've got to pull it now. And then obviously, because when you say I come in as well, I like compress and I just pull that li- like little millisecond too late and I pull in my suspension's already compressed and I just do like the deer kind of thing. But um, yeah. but yeah, it was, um, it was, it was definitely an ordeal. Um, yeah, no, that was, uh, that was <laughs> definitely an ordeal. Oh man. At least it got like, I got some slow-mo from different angles and stuff. And yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to have uh, a massive if you're gonna, if, Yeah, exactly. If you're going to crash, at least get it on camera. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And full slow-mo and yeah, really show the pain. <laughs> but that was good, man. I was still, I think back to that run, man. And I'm like, I have no regret for trying to pull the trigger on that thing. Like if I didn't, I think I'd be more annoyed. Like if I didn't, and got eighth or whatever I was sitting before I crashed, I think I'd be more let down that I didn't go for something that I knew I could do. So that was... Yeah, for sure. You, at the end of the day, you can't be bummed that you gave it your all. Yeah, no, I was, um, I was pumped. And that's funny. It's just like, yeah, if you can finish a run with a massive crash and still be as excited as you would if you had a good run, I'm just like, well, what's, what's, what's the problem? Like, Yeah, that's, that's good to keep perspective for sure oh man like i was obviously i was a bit hurt but it's funny as well like you know when you see someone like get up and don't it doesn't have a tissy fit and throw their goggles and stuff like yeah yeah. everyone's pumped man like everyone's so pumped and it's just like that thing how you can flick someone's i guess sense of outcome because obviously they see someone crash and they're straight away like well he's going to be pissed off and he's going to be angry and he's going to have a tissy fit and throw his goggles and like that's expected but just because it's expected doesn't mean it takes away from how people are going to feel about it. But I was just like, I'm just going to come down and be pumped still. And it's just so good. Cause then everyone else is like, yeah, like they're even more excited. Cause like, if you do well and you're ex- like excited, everyone's like, that's, that's, that's the, the playbook of how it goes. You do well, you're, you're pumped. But if you can like change that thing, it's like you do poorly and then you're still pumped. It's just like, that gives people like this extra energy, I guess, to be like, nah, you're a good dude. Like that's, that's, that's cool. Yeah, for sure. I think you definitely have a very um, good perspective on that. Like looking back at Fort Bill last year, like it definitely wasn't a great weekend for either of us. And you definitely had a way better uh, mindset with the whole thing than I did. Yeah. And that too, that's, that's a hard one, especially for you because you went from such a high to such a low and it's just like how you manage those like emotions. And the thing that I'm trying to work on now is trying to not let, a position, a place, a person or anything decide the outcome of how I feel. So I'm like, and it's the whole thing. It's like, once you can figure that out, once you can just be happy with where you are, what you're doing, who you are, all that, all the rest is just a bonus. And then if it goes the wrong way, you're still happy with what you've got. So it's just like, you don't, you don't read so much into those emotions. And I think you're always like, it's good to be angry and it's good to be upset about a bad result. Cause that gives you motivation to push harder. But at the same time, you just don't want to be, you don't want to be in that moment for longer than you have to. So it should be like, you'd have a shit result. Yeah, you, you yeah f- absolutely. You feel like you feel that anger, you feel that motivation. You use that for the next weekend or the next training session or whatever you want to call it. But you don't sit in those feelings. Cause I think that's what people do. They just, they sit in those feelings mm. for way too, way too long. And then like, it just, it turns into like this evil little thing you carry around with yourself and it just, it brings everyone down. And then it's just like, what is it? What does Biggie say? um negativity brings failure and we're not looking to fail so i'm like just be positive like it's but they're funny it's so it's such a it's a hard thing to do though man like it's obviously like for you you went from a podium to i guess what'd you get 30th or something like that afterwards i got like 50 something. yeah dude i was the same like i went from like almost the top 10 i got 11th and then i went to like yeah i think i got 30th or something like that and it's such a big like new team they were all pumped everyone's excited to then like not even in the in the ballpark so i'm just like how do you manage such a such a a jump in yeah in 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 feelings i guess so that's just for sure and reflection is so crucial but you definitely need to stress like reflecting on it you know what did i do well what didn't i do well um but then like you said like there's a there's a, a time limit where like you know, this is your time to be angry, to reflect, to 
you know, kind of just assess your emotions. And then at a certain point, you just got to move, move forward, mm. let it, let it go. Exactly. And I've just been, if I feel those ways, I just separate myself from anyone. Cause I know I don't want my feelings um, affecting someone else in a bad way, even with just like posting stuff. Like sometimes I write something and it'll be a bit negative and I'll be like, why do I want to put that into someone reading that? Like, that's the whole thing about just putting out good energy because I'm like, you can be pissed off and write all this stuff, but then you look back at it and you're like, why, why, like, why did I write that? Like that's some kid somewhere has read that and be like, Oh, that's like, you're always bringing him down. Cause I'm just like, sure. Be angry about a shit result or something. Your bike didn't work properly or something bad happened. But then it's just like, then you're just putting that out there. Someone, someone could take that and be like, well, now I'm bummed out for what happened. But if you could put out there, like just say you crashed or had a mechanical or something, but you're like, Oh, such a good weekend. Like enjoyed it with all my friends and all this good stuff. Someone's going to read that and be like, Oh, that's sick. He still had a really good time and enjoyed it. And that's going to just build more positivity towards them. It's just like, well, why not spread that stuff? That's like my, my big thing now is like not having a race, a result or any of that really impact how I feel. So I should just feel good no matter what. Like, and I think now with the whole situation of what's going on, just the fact of going to race my bike and hopping on a plane and all that, like that should be looked at as a win. Like you should be, you should get to a race feeling like you've already won before you've even like put your dirt, like tires in the dirt. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. So. I feel like, I feel like last year and even this year, like I've gained so much perspective and I think it's just huge to not, like it's so easy with society these days, like whatever you do, like that's you, you know what I mean? Mm. Like that's your identity. And at the end of the day, like it's just bikes is something that we do. Like we race bikes, but that's not who we are. Like there's tons of other stuff that we're passionate about that we love. Mm. Um, so I think just keeping that, that perspective is huge. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you myself or you are like, we're not typical mountain bike people, I guess. Like we have so many other like interests and passions and hobbies and I love the mountain biking community, but I wouldn't say that's like that. That's, that's everything. That's me in one nutshell. And like, I don't really know where I fit into. So like I, I do like so many different things and I'm around so many different people. It's just like, yeah, what's your, I guess, what's your group? And I'm like, I don't really, I don't want to have one group. I want to just like be kind of a little bit of everywhere. And I think that's, because even like anything, like you get good at something, everyone, like even I've got friends like, oh yeah, he's a mountain biker or he's a racer or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but that like, that people kept their own, make their own assumption off that. But it's just like, there's so much more. You just dig that little bit deeper. So I think it's trying to just project that as well, more so. And really like actually show what you're into, what you do, what you like, who you are more as a person than just like, oh, I, ride, I race bikes down hills because that's, I don't know, it's pretty just... <sighs> like the whole image of that and you see people and it's just, I don't know, I find it a bit boring, but I guess that's because we've done it for so long as well. And we obviously, a lot of our friends are that whole racer, men, racer person, I guess you'd say. So I think to like separate mm. yourself from that a little bit, it's just like give yourself your own little identity and a little like flair or flavor or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, and I, I like think of me personally, like, you know, the, the stuff that I'm passionate about outside of racing, whether it's surfing or motocross um, or whatever, like the, the people that I'm fans of, like I already know what they do. Like what makes me more so of a fan is, you know, what are they passionate about outside of that? Like mm. who are they as a person? Would I want to hang out with that person type thing? Yeah. Um, instead of just like, oh, that guy rides a dirt bike really sick. Uh, I'm a mm. huge fan of him type thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think like a really good example of that is like Muhammad Ali, like he was known as a boxer and obviously that's like where he got his platform and who he was, but he he's remembered for all the other stuff he did outside of the boxing ring and how he was as a person and like motivational and just stood for stuff and all of those things. So I'm like, he was a great boxer, but it's like what he did outside the ring was what like cemented him in like history books as being the person he was. And I guess that's just like a lot of, people they'll get a platform from being good at something, but it's what they can use that platform to then put in, push themselves or, or put into people's minds of like who they are as a, as a person. And I think that's more way, way more important than like what you can do with that. And yeah, it's just like trying to, how you get that out there and how you present yourself as, as what you want to present yourself as, which is. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's, we've been blessed with these, you know, platform or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, th I think it's really cool that, you know, you use that to try and make a positive impact 
um, there's definitely like a lot of things that I want to do or I, I'll want to do in the moment, like things that like mean a lot to me, like something I want to say or whatever. And then it's like almost easy to just be like, oh, no, like, mm. like you know, it, it doesn't matter or it won't make an impact type thing yeah yeah exactly but i think like i've got to kind of almost pinch myself sometimes and think about like the impact that we do have on especially like such a young crowd of kids like and like that the years that like obviously you get into mountain biking are probably like when you're like 10 to 20 kind of that's the obviously teenage years or, or early childhood um your brain's like a sponge pretty much and you take influence from so many different things so i'm like if you can put something positive because like you think back when you were 16 or 15 or whatever like who who did you look up to who was like the idol riding back then that's that, st that stands out in your mind oh it could be motocross or like or, or surfing yeah or i mean gwenny like me growing up like that was he was, that was the a man yeah but you look at that and you look at like i had like sam hill that was the guy and i looked he was like a, like i looked i got more influence than what he did than anyone else like i wanted to mm. be like him i wanted to do everything he did i wanted to just yeah be that person like that was the goal and i was so driven towards that because that was where my focus was so i'm like if i can put out some kind of positive thing and then the kids are like oh well he's real positive and he does this and that that could influence them in such a positive way and a good way it's just like well why not why not do that so it's just like yeah yeah, yeah absolutely but sometimes I don't even realize like you'll you'll post something or you'll say something and you kind of not realize the weight that that can carry to someone, especially younger than you. So it's always, you've got to kind of check yourself sometimes, but at the same time, I want to be myself. So it's that balance about being yourself, but also kind of, I guess, holding back and, and really thinking about what you're, um, what you're putting out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've been so, so blessed with, you know, people taking me under my, under their wings and, um, you know, just taking the time to teach me and, and help me get to where I am today. So that I think like that whole kind of just like passing it forward type thing has really been instilled in me because people have taken such great care of me um, and really helped me get to where I am. Um, so I, it's definitely like, I definitely do enjoy um, trying to give off some of my knowledge if if it's asked for type thing um Dude, it's just the whole being a and, being uh, a being a mentor is such a like i see more and more as i'm like bit maturing a bit more it's like the whole idea of a mentor is like the information you can get and the the wisdom and all that is just like it's it's invaluable like it's it's so important to especially like young minds and i'm seeing that more and more now and really trying to latch on to people that have done what I want to do or like it, it further ahead of me and like really helping them bring me up because I'm not one to really like I don't mind reading going through books or or studying just say stuff online or whatever but if you can find someone that is obviously past where you want to be or down the down the path a bit further and you can latch on and really grab onto what they've got like you can you can involve yourself so much quicker like even even recently I when I moved um to Mount Beauty I was living with these two girls and just with diet and just, I guess, a bit more spirituality and just like viewing the world a different way, good and bad, but it just, it just like, it's like pouring petrol on it. Just like your, your, your growth in knowledge is just ridiculous. And now that, now that's all I want to do is just like latch onto people like that and just kind of bring me up and kind of realize at this, like we like kind of look at it as like, I don't know anything. And like, once you kind of start realizing you don't know anything, that's when you start really soaking in information. You kind of put down the wall, drop the ego a little bit and go, Hey, I don't know how that, I don't know how that works, but I want to know this person could help me go and like, and question, and like question them as well. But then when you question it, you're going to obviously get more back from it instead of just sitting there and be like, Oh, okay. 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 And it's just all kind of just water under the bridge, but it's just like, you actually stop, ask questions, challenge that person, get answers and then grow as a person. I think that's, that's one of the biggest things I've learned from this, this time. Um, well, I guess like the whole pandemic lockdown time is like trying to work out myself better and then how I can actually educate myself with certain things by latching on to people that have done what I want to do. Yeah. Being, being in that sponge state is like such a freeing uh, feeling, mm -hmm. you know, like I, 
just like you said, like dropping your ego and just, and seeing, you know, latching onto someone that's been there before, like you're essentially saving yourself so many lessons that you don't have to learn because they've already learned them and they're, you know, um, instilling that knowledge upon you. Mm. No, that's really, do you feel like since obviously you actually, you got to go over and race, um, well not race, but practice, <laughs> practice for world champs, but have you felt like, well, I crank work. Oh, you did. Yeah. Yeah. You did get a podium actually. I was going to ask you about that, but when, cause did you have a point when you just didn't think anything was going to happen? Like, did you have a point when you just thought, well, the world cup's completely done or were you in the back of your mind? Like, yeah, we will get to some races. Um, I mean, I, I stayed ready all year as far as training. Um, but I think when they canceled, I'm trying to think, I don't know if they can cancel Leger or Lenzer Hyde first, but when they canceled one of them, I was like, right, if they cancel the next one, like that's the season done for sure. And then sure enough, that next one, whatever it was that got canned. And I was like, Oh, there's no way it's happening. Um, and then, but everything kind of started like, everything kind of started coming together as far as like, you know, everyone was still planning to go over and, and then it got to the point where I was like pretty set. I was like, Worlds is happening for sure. If the next, if the following two World Cups happen, um, that's just an added bonus. But even if they don't, just racing World Champs, like that's a pretty salvaged year. Yeah. But was that, was that a struggle for you to constantly have the goalpost moved? Because that, that affected me more than I thought it would by having like, okay, this is when you're going to be over there. And then it's like, no, that's cancelled. Now it's going to be here. Now that's cancelled. That's going to be here. Was that, was that, was that a bit of a struggle? Because I, I kind of, I, <laughs> I didn't deal with it well at all. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you and I have had so many conversations over the, this whole, the course of this whole uh, pandemic, just talking about this, like it, it's gnarly. Um, I literally trained for 10 months. Like I started training in November for the race in March and then like had such a good build up, was ready to go. Like I literally had my bags packed. I was leaving for the airport in two hours. The team hey, called I, me and was like, yeah, don't get on that plane. You were in Portugal. Like, I, was at, I was at the pits, man. I was at the pits. Yeah. Uh, and so, and I, that literally, that same process literally happened, what, three or four times? Like, right, here's the new revised schedule. All right, like, chat with Chris. All right, you know, let's, let's, let's plan from here. Let's take a bit of a re like reset. Let's build back up, build it back up, and then race gets canceled or rescheduled or whatever you want to call it and then mm. do it all over again. So it was definitely um, it was definitely really hard to keep motivation, especially too, because it's like, you know, you're doing these sessions that you don't want to do. You're like, why am I putting myself through this? Like, you're just having that, that thought in the back of your head, like, this isn't even gonna be worth it. You're not even gonna use it type thing. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, why, why are you doing this? Like, why are you doing this if you're not even gonna go race? So yeah. just having a battle with that, um, I just try to take, take comfort in the fact that everyone was dealing with the same thing mm. and I was just prepared to be ready to go whenever that time came. Um, um but not to say it wasn't hard because it, it was definitely, it was definitely really gnarly. And, but just, it, I got like a really good break with like, like being able to do those two national races here in the States. Like that was so nice to like go and like, go through the race process because it had been so long and then even getting over to, to go race and do crank works um those helped a lot and doing like getting out getting some good riding on those um on those trips were huge um but the whole process you know of starting at Latin november and then trying to build up like all the resets and having to deal with all that was really gnarly and i mean you could see it across the board with with all the athletes going through the same thing, like it, it's gnarly for sure. Um, but you got to keep perspective. Everyone's dealing with the same thing. And at the end of the day, we're super blessed to be able to get to do what we do. Um, mm. And there was so many people losing their jobs and, and this really just destroying them. So um, mm. we have it pretty well off for sure. Yeah, no, that is one thing you kind of look at look at the hole and like what we've at, like we say it's a challenge but I'm, I'm realistically it's like yeah we've still got our job we just can't perform to the level we would normally perform at or in front of the people we'd normally perform at but did you like you're saying before when you when you're obviously training and you kind of have that doubt in your mind that it will actually happen because i feel like with any top level athlete it's like you can push to 90 percent, but it's that last 10 to all five percent whatever you want to call it that's like 
that's 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 the grit like that's the hard yards you put in and like you need that goal to sustain that that drive up until you go to the race and as soon as you take that oh it might not happen it's like i can happily push to 90 percent and be comfortable but it's like you need to bury yourself in like the hurt box to get to that 100 percent. but it's like when there wasn't as a clear goal to go for it just feels like you're just working out really hard or training or it's just it just it puts that asterisk next to it and puts that little bit of doubt in your mind. And I think that was the biggest thing I struggled with was like, I wasn't pushing myself to that limit because it was almost just like, why? Like, and it should, it should, you should, that's another thing. You shouldn't have that. You shouldn't have to have that world cup to push yourself to that limit. You should just do it because you want to find out your limits and how hard you can push yourself. But it just, it just helps when you've actually got a target to aim for when you just, you kind of just free shooting and looking at whatever. It's just like, well, I can't focus all my energy into one point. I'm kind of just kind of going with the flow in a certain way. But did you, um, when it first got, for canceled, sure. And I think just like, take. no, go. Sorry, sorry go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, I was just saying like, I just try to take like each re like, you know, new proposed schedule. Like I kind of just try to take that as like, that's the word, like it's going to happen. Um, and then just use that for the goal, each reset. Um, not to, like, obviously like you're, you're battling with the thought that, oh, this probably isn't going to happen or whatever. But I just tried to like put as much confidence in that as I could. So that way I could, you know, use it as a goal, like you're saying, so you can mm. build towards it. Mm. Mm -hmm. No, it's definitely, I think it's, even the people that did do well, just say like Matt Walker, Greg, like obviously a lot of the top guys, it does show a lot of, I guess, mental strength not only to just be able to maintain that for so long, but then have back-to-back -back races where that's obviously another challenge as well that people haven't faced before. And then to just be so solid all the way through. That was another thing I was going to ask as well with the, what do you think of the back-to-back -back races? Because as a fan watching from home, I thought it was really good and gives us obviously more of an opportunity, but it's going to be probably a different case when you're thrown in the thick of that and you've got to do five days of, of riding slash racing. Yeah, for sure. That's, it's definitely a lot of time going really fast. Mm. Um, and I, I think like, like you said, like it's kind of hard to comment on because we weren't going through the process. Um, I could definitely imagine that it would be very mentally taxing. And I, I heard that a lot of people were saying that, that were there racing, that it's just, you're just so mentally drained after it. Mm. Um, that being said, I think it is a really good uh, format to like, they're kind of talking about maybe trying to do some at the beginning of next year. Like it's a lot, it's, it's a really good opportunity to get like, get the season going, get a lot, get some points going um, mm. like a good base. Mm. And since there's, you know, since we've been so limited on time, like I think it was a really good option for sure. Like that, them adapting um, them being UCI, like let's, you know, let's try and make it, let's try and get as much as we can out of this. Um, mm. I, I definitely could see it being very gnarly and I was very prepared that it was going to be like a mental struggle going that fast and for so long um, and, and having to perform so many times in such a short period window. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely think it's a good option for sure. I, yeah. I was thinking that as well. Cause I did a race um, uh, last year for national champs and we had the national champs build up till Sunday. And then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was Oceana. So it was a similar kind of form, actually more like a total of six days of um, riding and racing. But I was, I went into Oceana's cause it was almost like the nationals were the bigger prize kind of build up. Yeah. And then Oceana's no one really cared about. So I think the fact that it was also like you were going into a smaller race that didn't mean as much kind of, killed the vibe for everyone but it was just stressful like you say just going that fast that many days is is quite taxing but also the i the whole idea imagine if we had a 16 round series that went to all the same places because it's it's a lot of effort for teams ourselves to travel from scotland to austria with trucks and everything and you get one three minute run or one four and five minute run whatever it whatever it is so it's like if you can build in a two race weekend it just seems like you get more value for money being there and then we might not even if you cut and then you might cut down where we go or i don't know i feel like it just yeah like more value for money of where we actually get to go and what we get to do but i was also thinking even if they maybe made qualifying the same as um as a race so they even if they raced just two races on the same track almost like a moto style thing where they have obviously two motos but 
have the first day practice, even time training. Um, and time training could almost be like a qualifier or something like that. Like, a, like, and that, that, like how, that could work fine because then you're obviously, you're still on the time. You obviously have the, but there's no points involved. It just sets you up for where you start. And then um, Saturday you have, a, it's just a race. It's just the race. It's because we build up to it anyway, it's just because we call it qualifying. We don't put as much importance on it, but the points aren't the same. But if you just had that's a race and then Sunday's another race, televise everything and build it up like a race. I feel like that could be something. So it's like, you're still doing what we're used to, but you're getting twice as much coverage, twice as much, twice as many points. And that could build more into a, like a bit more of a story or a series. And then we won't be maybe as mentally drained, but I think that's just another option, but I think it's, it'd just be good to almost change it a little bit, like add a bit of just to see what works and what doesn't work instead of just being so stale with the whole idea. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, I, I think that, the event organizers and UCI like did a great job with, with making it happen. Cause I feel like it could have been so easy to just, you know, cancel the whole series. Um, so what, what the season did end up becoming, uh, I think is everyone would agree that they definitely salvaged the year for sure. Mm. No, they, that's, that's the thing. I, I, I thought honestly in Croatia, no, not Croatia, Portugal, as soon as we got told we were going home and how it was all happening. Cause the team were all together and everyone's like, Oh, I guess I'll see you at Fort William. And I was just like, you're not going to like Fort Williams not happening. Like you just, yeah. like I, I knew at that point and I kind of wrote off in my mind, I was like, the year's done, everything's over. And I was convinced of that until even, and then everything got rescheduled. It was a bit of a shock. And then once it started to get cancelled, I was like kind of no shit in a way, but it was, um, it was something that I didn't think would go ahead at all, but it's, it's obviously they pulled through and they did a lot of work to make it happen. Um, yeah. And I think like you said, like it, it definitely, if they wanted to change it up, like it's definitely a good time to do so. And then you could even try like do double headers and then just take the points out of qualifying. So it's just finals on Saturday. Mm. Um, and that might be a way to kind of ease the, the mental burden um, from having to do four, you know, times like uh, high value runs within mm. a weekend. If you take the points off of qualifying, um, mm. that, I think, that might work. I think it'd be one of those things as well. It just seems like, it seems really stressful because it's new. Like that's another thing. It's like once we, if we did a season doing that, then it would just be like, well, this is what we do now. Like you would adapt, yeah, yeah, you, you'd, sure. you'd adapt to that. It's just because it's out of the norm. It's just like, Oh, like this is, this is crazy. Yeah. We're doing, we're doing four heavy, like fast runs. So it's just like, that's insane. But it's when you, when you break it down, that's what you're probably doing 10 minutes of, intense racing really and i know it's like it's, yeah. it's, it's it's hard to quantify how what effort goes into mental strength and all that but it's on on the grand scheme of things it's not it's not a crazy crazy thing to actually think to achieve um and yeah I think, and you can see like the guys that did well during those those races are the guys that are so good with dealing with all that um all, all the, the stories of racing you know the highs and the lows so mm. it, like you said i mean i think once once it kind of the, the newness wears off i think everyone would adapt pretty quickly mm, exactly um another thing i want to ask you we're talking before about like highs and lows and managing um i guess success and then failure and how we react to it but how did you react with obviously all this build up from going for all this build up from training for months and months and months you finally get overseas you do a crank works race you got third didn't you at um in yeah Europe? Like getting third, going to Worlds, and then what happened? Was it in qualifying or time training? You crashed and hurt your wrist. Is that is that how it happened? Qualifying. Yeah. So then how was then going from such a high to such a low, but then for obviously Reese winning your teammate, then going to such a high again? Was it just a weird series of like, how do I feel? Kind of what what's, what's the vibe here with everything? Because it would have been such a, a weird... Like it's just a lot of emotions to be like mixed into one kind of weekend, I guess you'd say. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it was gnarly, like having such a build up, getting through COVID, like flying over, you know, ready to go, um, doing the riding beforehand, going to Crankworks, like kind of getting that justification that like we're in a good spot and and I was ready to go. Um, and then going to Worlds and making it a day and a half before breaking my hand. Like it was, it was really hard. And I truly thought that this year was going to be really special. I felt like I was in a really good place um, with myself and the team and, and 
the bike and all that. And then to kind of get there and feel like you could do something special and then have it taken away after having such a build up towards it was really gnarly. Um, it was definitely pretty hard. Um, I was pretty devastated. Um, but then obviously on the other end, like so psyched for Reese, um, like he crushed it and I was very happy for him. And it was so cool for the team to experience that. And then, but even with that, like I'm sitting at the bottom watching a finals that I should be in yeah. with a broken hand. So it, it was definitely a, a lot of kind of contrast. Yeah. But also with that, I feel like you're going to, like I've definitely got to think that you're going to learn more from that. Like that, that I, I, it's like, it could go two ways. It could just build like, not even build it. It could go like you, you know, I was talking about using that anger or like using that pain and like seeing it and being like, like that's like, that should be like putting, like building the fire for like next year of like, cause that's one thing when I was, when I was at home, I wasn't sure how I'd feel about watching it. And I was just like, so excited to just be like, Oh, like, I know I could be there. I know I could be doing this. And like, it just got me pumped, man. It got me pumped to ride my bike again. And even now, like I'm, I, I got the new, um, my new downhill bike and I just go look at it. I'm like, this is sick. Like, I'm so like, I feel like a little kid again. Yeah, yeah. Like I just want to ride again. And I think being, having it all taken away. And then obviously with an injury as well, it just like is enhanced. Like once you can't do something, it shows you how much you actually want to do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for like, as soon as I get healthy and healed and just what, yeah, what can happen next year. I'm, I'm really excited for it. And just like the gratitude I'm going to have going into next year as well is going to be, mm. is going to be so big. Like I'm, just gonna just to hop on a plane man to get on a plane and leave the country i'm just gonna be like this is this is such a good feeling but i feel like that's just gonna build into like a good a race weekend and just being around everyone again because I'm, I'm like i miss the crew of people at a world cup like that's it's gonna yeah. be a lot it's, it's gonna be over a year since i've seen everyone and just to be back in that environment and being like this is what i get to do for a job and we got taken away for a year and now what can i do now that i'm back and fit healthy and motivated yeah. And it was, I, I felt the exact same. Like when I was over there, like I just had this like overwhelming sense of like, cause obviously like, I'm sure you heard like the weather was super gnarly like before. Cause I went like, I went probably almost two weeks early cause I was going to do some riding at Schladming and then race Crankworks. But like, so we had that really gnarly snowstorm, like it shut the mountains mm. down for a few days, but like I just had this overwhelming sense of like gratitude and just like the, the beauty I was seeing from the mountains, like covered in snow, like it was unlike anything I had ever seen before. Like the whole trip, I was just like so psyched. Mm. Um, and just had this like overwhelming sense of gratitude. Like I was so happy to be there. And it was, it was really cool. Like just have that, like mm. I, aside from racing, like I was genuinely like enjoying myself so much being there. Not that I don't, like I always love going racing, but it was, it was yeah. really cool to, to be in that state. And I feel like, just like you said, like, you know, from having that, that season taken away, obviously I'm a bit of a different boat than you because I was able to go over there, but mm. you know, still like 75% of the year is gone. Like just getting over there was such an awesome feeling. Um, mm. So like you said, I think everyone's going to have a, a whole new perspective on racing from this year and then going into next year as well. So um, I was, uh, it was good too to keep perspective. Like I was very happy with how I rode while I was there. Obviously, like I, I had a good race at Crankworks. I was happy with how I rode in the mud at Schladming beforehand, and even at Worlds before I got hurt. Like I was feeling really good. So just like you said, like it just makes me more excited for next year. Yeah, and just yeah, focus on all those positives, not the obviously negative of not being able to actually race because it's like well, you can't change that now. That's something that's that's yeah, obviously uh, absolutely. And I think I d dealt with that a bit when I got home. Like like even watching the GoPro, I'm like, Oh, why couldn't my like have pedal just been like a millimeter higher? Like if I just dropped my outside foot just a little bit more, like it wouldn't have clipped type thing. Yeah. Um, but then once you can get to the point where it's like, is what it is, like you got to move forward. Um, then you're, you're good to go as far as um, working away from it. So, but mm -hmm. I, I am stoked too. Like, I think it's good for, for you and myself that there's such a quick turnaround this year. Like, you know, like, like I just had my first day of training today and mm -hmm you know, the first race is going to be at the beginning of April. Like it's going to be here before we know it. So it's not like we 
had this massive chunk of time to kind of sit at home and just like dwell like oh i wish i raced this year type thing yeah yeah exactly because as soon as i get like i'll get this surgery done and then as soon as that's healed which will probably be like end of november that's just like i'm still training now but like that's when it's just like start of december is just like yep go go time and then it's just like yeah what's that a, yep. a, mu- a month away or so so it's gonna be something it's like well you don't get time to be like yeah not not like ponder on what like what's happened it's just like well what's gonna happen now and go forward which has been really cool mm. but it's funny how yeah, i've always go ahead. Okay. i was just gonna say it's no no you go ahead because I, I was gonna lead into something else uh, i was just gonna say like obviously with my faith and like i fully trust god's plan and i've always eat all these like quote-unquote hard times not that i've like dealt with much like you know like really like my my ish like issues with racing my highs and lows have you know the lows have been very minuscule um mm-hmm. but that being said at the end of it i've always been so thankful for for what's become of it um you know the end result and working through it and then getting back to the point where like you feel like you've gotten out of it like mm-hmm. for example like last year like breaking my wrist and then ending on a podium like that was mm-hmm. such a good feeling to push through it and then end um so i all the adversity is I've definitely been thankful for it. And just like you said, like you learned so much from it. Well, that's the thing you, someone, I listened to a podcast the other day and the guy was saying, would you rather, if you could go back through your life and you could take everything you've learned from the hardship, the pain, the injuries, the, the, the heartbreak and all that, or you could learn everything you, you could, and you could keep all that knowledge you've got, or you could keep all the knowledge from like the success and the happiness like which one would you pick? And everyone's just like, well, the hardship. Cause that's when you learn. Like that's, I listen to a guy who calls it just like the pain teacher and the pain teacher just like, it, 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 it is fucking one hell of a teacher, but it's gonna, <laughs> you gotta strap, <laughs> you, you, you gotta strap in and listen to him. And that's the thing. It's like people, I guess with, like we talked about before, like painkillers and not actually dealing with the pain. It's like the person sitting up the back of the classroom and the pain teacher's trying to tell you something and you're kind of like, dicking around and not paying attention to it obviously that's going to stretch out over a lot longer time but if you're the guy at the front taking note and okay what's this pain going to teach me and what can i get from it you're the one that's going to move through it and actually learn a lot more and that's that's the thing now it's even looking at like what we've gone through now and just like what can we learn from it how can we build from it but like you said before with like you you've kind of got your faith in like god's plan of what happens and it's the whole thing it's like people say everything happens for a reason, which I, I, I do believe that, but at the same time, it's like you make that you make those reasons, like, or you, you, you react to what happens. So I'm like, if something, I, I look at everything now, man, like, I don't think bad things happen because like, I'm, I'm in like, if you feel good right now within yourself and how you are as a person and what you put out there. And if you're just, if life's good, I'm like, well, nothing bad's happened because that, that everything that's happened has got you to this point. So I'm like, well, what, how can you look at just say, my injury or your injury is being something's bad if you're happy right now and that's the thing people dwell on this shit and they go oh i broke my wrist and like all this bad shit happened but i'm like breaking your wrist or getting surgery or or getting kicked off a team can teach you something that then can build and go forward so i was i was talking to um my housemate dudes the other day about how i broke my heel in 2016 and you could look at that as, oh, like, what could have been if I didn't do that? And like, all this good stuff could have happened and I could have maybe got podiums or I could have been this and life could have been so much different. Or I could look at it as like, well, I broke my heel because of that. I started living with you. We've got a really good relationship now. And where I am at my life now to do because of you is such a positive. So I'm like, that could have been the best thing that happened to me. Like that could have been something that's obviously created so many opportunities and options. But we, we look at it with like a negative feel or a negative bias towards it and it's just like look at it as just something that's happened and like obviously like you say with like god's plan or whatever plan it is or whoever makes it happen or ourselves i'm like okay well that's going to create something and you've got to learn from that but people don't want to learn from that they just want to just go oh well this is shit i'm just gonna just do whatever and just let it let let whatever is going to happen happen but i'm like no you need to like engage yourself and kind of I don't know, just just learn from it learn from it and take note and look at it from a different angle look at it from the outside in and then yeah what and then grow from it really as a person is on at the end yeah for sure that's amazing I totally totally agree and it's uh, you your growth is found in the pain and the hard times like you mm. realistically you you don't learn anything really from success um obviously like you learn a little bit but you learn 
so much more through the hard times. Mm. Um, that's where you find growth as a human and, and, um, hey, your real friends you know, are. where you, where you look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, it, and, and like I said, I, I, I always have been thankful for, you know, what I thought should have happened, um, not happening and mm. you know, what's, what's become of that. So. I was going to ask you as well, when you say like God's plan, like it's, it's a pretty broad question to ask and it's kind of not sure how you would pinpoint it to anything, but like, what, what does God mean to you as a, as yeah, as a whole or as, as everything, I guess it's kind of something to hard to pinpoint a, just a one answer kind of thing, but what would you say? Like the whole idea of God or greater power or being or all of that. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm a Christian, so, um, first off god is love um and uh he's a father um and jesus christ is our savior he died for us um sacrificed himself for us so uh that's god to me that's that's it but with with god do you i look at god now as like i i'm not i'm not religious or anything like that but i believe there's like obviously there's a greater power like some we're here something's put us here we're not we're not just floating in this black space for no reason but I look at God now as, as kind of being everything and everyone, like everything's a part of this thing that we call life and earth and, and everything. So I look at now as I feel a bit more of like a overwhelming connection with everything, whether it be trees, cows, sheep, you, me, everyone, like we're all one thing. We're all ended up here. We don't know how, we don't know why. So I think that's like the whole, God is, is everything and everyone. And like you said, like it is, it is love and it is, it is caring for those people. It is viewing them as like yourself. Like I look at like, it's the whole thing, treat someone as you want to be treated. And what does it do? No, what does it do onto to others as you have done unto yourself? So it's like, I really see that. It's just like, cause you, you are me, you're, you're here, you're conscious, you're all of that. And so is the person that you probably don't like or something like anything. It's all, it's all one. And we don't understand why we're here and why we've, we've got consciousness, but, I think once you start understanding that we are like, there's not the, there's no, there's yeah. Every, we, we fight and kill people and fuck up the earth and do all this shit and chase money and all this crap for, for what kind of thing where it's just like, if you actually step back and just go, let's all just kind of this cliche as it says, just get along and work together and go forward, like how much better it would all be. And I definitely see that as like the, if you can view God as that, as we're all one, I think that could be a, a positive that people could, um, pull out i guess hope and just drive from mm. but yeah I, th- I thought i'd ask you because it's funny even like i i guess when when we met because i i've i've never i haven't looked at like religion as being a good or a bad thing i've just kind of seen it as as being there and i, I haven't been super um drawn into it but i think more lately i've like it's there's obviously it gives hope or gives love to a lot of like so many fucking people like half like over probably half the world but it's just like what you know, what does that actually mean to these people and like how does how, what can you get from it because obviously it, it, it's it gives you when you look at it you look at it as giving you a path to this is why it should happen and then it kind of takes away like I said before nothing bad really happens it's things just happen it's how you, like you react to these things and you can react negative negatively positively or just with not, no emotion at all but it's just like you give everything that happens energy or power over you so i'm like as soon as you look at it as like well this was meant to happen whoever put us here wanted this to happen what can i learn from this and once you start looking at it like that like you obviously do it's just like life's well, pretty fucking sweet <laughs> at, the, at that point yeah 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 absolutely and I, the great thing about christianity is that it's you know it's not a religion it's a relationship mm. um And at the end of the day, like Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, bearing our sins is the ultimate display of love. Um, Mm. You know, he, he felt all our sins while he suffocated on the cross. So um, to, to be a child of God is, is an amazing blessing. Um, And I'm so thankful for, for everything he's done in my life. Um, And it, it helps me gain perspective on racing because it's like, who I am judging off of the paper is not who I really am. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a follower of Christ and, and I'm loved no matter what. Um, and uh, you know, I have an eternal life after, um, this life and, um, it, it just helps me gain tons of perspective. And it's been amazing. Um, what he, 
what Jesus Christ has done with me through my racing career, like that's through my racing career has been the closest I've ever felt towards him. And I truly believe that he's all these pivotal moments throughout my career it has been because of him. And it's mm-hmm. been like his plan. And I have felt like there's no, there's no way that this is getting messed up. Like he's behind it. Like this mm-hmm. is going to happen type thing. And it's been really cool that I feel very blessed that my occupation, um, I've, I've been able to have such close encounters with Jesus through that. Mm. So no, that's amazing chuckles. That's really cool. I was, I was going to say as well, kind of going back to when we were talking about before how you would kind of like appreciate things after they're gone, but almost we don't live in, like we don't appreciate them while they're happening. And I was just thinking back to obviously when we were teammates and the whole um, intense family kind of thing, especially with Jen sending those photos the other day. And it was just funny looking at that and just being like, obviously we enjoyed it so much, but then even looking back at now, you kind of really get to appreciate like what we had on that team with like you, myself, um, Jack and Nick, and just even like Bernat is the team manager and, and Jen has been the helper that ran around and all that. It's just like looking back at some of that and just like, damn, we had it, we had it really good. Like that was that was the obviously the the dream team for for so many people looking in from the outside and it was from that the inside looking out as well like how how good we actually had it yeah it was such a huge blessing to have just all those people like it was such a like the amount of fun we had over those years was <laughs> yeah. insane and like i know like personally for me it was so helpful because that was my first ever world cup ride and like getting on a team with you and Jack, like guys that have had success, they've been there, like you guys teaching me and being able to kind of go through it with you guys was so helpful. And I learned so much. And yeah, it's crazy. Like, I mean, all the time with Nick, I'm like, like, we're always kind of reminiscing on stuff. Like, Oh, do you remember that time at worlds when we had to battle with Renat to to not turn off the AC and like (laughs) we tried to rig the AC. So we couldn't, we told put the knob off of it. So we couldn't turn it down. (laughs) The Spanish sweat box there's uh, so many stories and it's like at the end of the day like I, I wouldn't change it for the world obviously um you know we all went our separate ways and I'm like I wouldn't change it for the world I don't want to be anywhere but track but that being said like you know those years were so amazing and such a good foundation to build off of and the relationships we made was insane like the amount of like if you if you think about the time like the elapsed time of us probably laughing over those two years, like it would be unfathomable. Yeah. Oh, dude. Some of those car rides from like airports to uh, just going to the track every morning. Like, do you, <laughs> I just think it back now. Do you remember when you're in the front seat and I threw a bit of chewing gum and it hit the front screen <laughs> and it just, just stuck to it. And then I did an Instagram video. I'm like, Charlie sticking his gum on the, the rental car or whatever. <laughs> And we were just in the back, just like, it wasn't that funny, but we were just thought it was the best thing. We were, we were probably hung over from some after party. I think it might've been after an Endora or something, but dude, the, I always look back at that and I don't think I took that year as seriously as I should, especially 2017 was definitely one where the fun kind of took over, over, um, I guess, results and being a bit more professional, but almost looking back, I'm just like almost worth it to a certain extent for the amount of good times we had and, dang it right as me telling you guys me telling you to wake me up when you come home so i can hang out or when you come home so i can hang out with you yeah the only person that likes getting woken up at 3 a.m oh like at andorra (laughs) when we woke you up and then um jack got on the computer and did the randy orton um in his (laughs) race run he's just like Randy Orton at it. I love how perfect he made it where he's like there's no way he's like i can do this i'm getting in the lab oh man such good times but that was just um, like yeah you guys you go party wake me up when you get home and we'll hang out <laughs> <laughs> oh but then you'd feel fine because you'd have a good sleep besides obviously a few hours and you'd just wake up the next day feeling fresh as a daisy oh <laughs> no that was fun but um going back to um what was i gonna say um just the whole the whole thing about like almost when you joined, you were obviously elite when you joined and I joined a factor team when I was in elite as well. So we didn't go through like the junior process. How do you, and then obviously we had Nikki who was just chest bra, front of the pack. I ain't following no one, American steel, just like 
The man, the man. So anyway, it's just funny. Like, I think we had it good because I almost think like the junior program is obviously an amazing thing to get onto, but it does pump your ego up massively. And I feel like Nikki went into this thing, like I'm the fastest American junior at the moment. I'm the man coming onto this team. And wasn't very humbled the first year. Definitely turned, turned himself around the second year. But how do you like, how do you feel about coming into a team um, going straight to an elite ride, not going through the junior process and like how you view juniors and what they should do to like come into a team and how they should kind of, I guess, act and carry themselves? Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I, I, I'm thankful that I didn't have a junior ride. Um, I think I had a, a bit of a different perspective getting a, getting a factory ride for the first time as a first year elite. Um, versus, you know, being on a factory team since I was 16. Mm. Um, so I, I was, like you said, like both of us had a bit of a different perspective on it. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, my junior career was so hard. Like I had people that helped me out so much. Like Jordy would always let me pit with Fox. Um, just all these certain people, even John Rourke um, would let me pit with the XC team when there was double races. Like all these people that helped me out tremendously. So I'm not going to sit here and be like, Oh, like I had it so hard as a junior. Um, but obviously we didn't have factory rides. And I know like your story, like it was a lot harder for you as a junior, as far as like getting over there. And I know SRAM helped you out and uh, that sort of thing. But I, I feel for these juniors these days because there's, there's such like a, like it feels like there's so much pressure to perform as a junior. And you're asking these like 16 and 17 year old kids like you're asking so much out of them and like mm. in the grand scheme of things, they they're so young and they haven't been through much. So if you don't get those results, I feel like it's really easy as a junior to be like, Oh, well, well that's done. Mm. Um, and in reality, like it, it's, it doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, like I didn't even get on a junior podium. Like I got two fourths my last year and that was it. But like, I never got on a junior podium mm. and even I didn't get any, you know, um, notable race results as a first year elite until the the uh, back end of the season so mm. just because you're not getting you know saying on junior podium does not mean that you can't um make something out of it and i was having the same conversation with uh tyler Irvin, who's a junior here in america and um we've been riding all this year like we do all our riding together him and then austin julie is another junior and you know those kids went over and did all the races and um they were a bit disappointed in their results. And it's like, you guys, like in the grand scheme of things, you've had no little, little to no experience in Europe. Like you got to keep it in perspective. And I was like, look, just cause you guys didn't get these results you wanted. doesn't mean that, um, doesn't mean that you, that nothing's going to happen. Like mm. you have time to grow for sure. Mm. Um, so I was talking with Tyler about that cause he went camping with me over the weekend. But um, I think, I think the juniors these days just need to keep it in perspective. Like I said, like, there's so much pressure to perform. Um, and just if, if the results don't come, don't let that beat you down. And, mm. and you certainly don't need to have a factory ride, you know, for your two years of a junior to um, have a successful world cup career. Like it's mm. definitely possible to do it without. Mm. I think that as well when like we obviously didn't have that luxury, it almost, helped us in a way because then you build a lot of connections with people in the pits or in, in the industry and then you've kind of the pressures within yourself to do well and you're you're chasing that factory ride you're chasing that good result where i think some of these kids that get put on a factory team it's like they're expected and then you're trying to deal with the pressure like it's it's a lot easier to chase something to to be the one to to lead to lead or push forward like and just mm. get expectations like expectations on a 16 year old kid from a, a proper global team is pretty intense like you don't even know how to work yourself out let alone <laughs> the ins and outs of running yourself as like a business kind of thing so it's a lot of yeah pressure. and they're like oh we want you to come over and win these world cups and win world champs and mm. and deal with all season of world cup racing and they've you're going first year junior you've never even raced a world cup yeah yeah and that's a that's a big step like from i don't care what anyone says even if you're a european kid racing you, like obviously the French cups will probably be the closest thing, but if you go on a world cup, it's a different, it's a different animal. Like everything just, it seems different. Like it's just, there's a different weight to it. There's a different atmosphere and 
if you're a, if you're a junior kid, especially for Australians, like we race these tracks that are that are pretty basic considering what we go over race World Cups, and then you throw them in the deep end at like Val in the wet. And like, what what do you expect is going to happen? It's going to be a it's going to be an eye opening experience. But I think almost building into that yourself and not having the pressure of someone pushing you is almost better. So it's like that balance of like you want to get kids on teams, but you also want them to find their own feet and and chase it before they have to really be expected to do well. For sure, and I think it if someone gets a ride real early, I think it could be easy for them to like get written off. You know, if you get on a team and you don't perform like I think it's pretty easy for um for the industry to kind of just be like oh well you know he's not going to make anything like let's like he's off the team type thing and then that's Mm. kind of it for them um versus Mm. you know if if you build into it and you have something to chase like I, I feel like that's um can be the better option obviously like there's tons of people that get rides as a junior and have tons of success and have an amazing career and it's really cool I I really appreciate that teams are looking for the next generation and they're picking up these kids early and um and trying to develop them and and help them go through it for sure like I'm thankful for that um but -hmm. like you said it's just there's there's two sides to it I think it's how the teams how the teams manage them as well like a a team should be really like more or less supportive and not so like result based and just really because that's that's like the results the results shouldn't be the focus for a, a first year junior or second year junior. It should just be getting comfortable and getting an understanding of how everything works and where we are. And it's more of like, it should just like, it's, it's learning. Like there is that results obviously are a part of that, but it shouldn't be like, we want you to win. We want you to be here, which obviously they don't probably wouldn't say that directly, but like, that's the kind of feeling I feel like most top teams would give to a rider where it should just be like, no, these are the years to grow. These are the years for you to ride with your older teammates mm. in elite and like, be a sponge to them and then use that in like either second year junior or maybe first year elite that's when it like builds into something but I feel like you say they come in and it's just straight away like results winning all this pressure all this like publicity and everything and I feel like that definitely plays with plays on a lot of kids minds yeah and it's like if you are picking up these kids because you see the talent and you see the potential like stick with it like see it through Mm -hmm. um and and see you know give them all the opportunities to let them grow and develop and see, see what they can do. Like, I think it would be smart for, you know, if, if you pick someone up either in their first year or second year junior, like commit to having them for a first year elite, because it's like, just cause they don't get all the results you want as a junior definitely does not mean that they don't have potential and can't make something happen because, you know, as you know, like that, that jump from a second year junior to first year elite, like it's, it's such a learning curve. Um, so you really don't know until, kind of that the tail end of that first year elite um mm-hmm. what's going to happen yeah that's yeah 100 percent. it can it can have a big jump either direction but it can still have a jump yeah it's a big 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 change that's cool i'm glad i'm glad nikki's still and i mean one. obviously it's like it's like we have a bit of a, a skewed perspective because obviously we're not seeing the numbers how much it actually costs to have a rider on the team so it's like obviously like there mm-hmm. are other things that go into it um but yeah, I, I think if, if you're going to pick someone up because you want to, you see the potential and you want them to grow, like stick with it, at least give them all the time to um, try and develop. Yeah, develop as a writer. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Not 100%. But that was good. It was, it, was, it, it was funny. I just say that because obviously when I first got a proper ride, I was so grateful, but I went through that hardship of like being a privateer. And I felt with Nikki, like especially the first year, like how I guess what do you call it um not 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 grateful but just like he he like expected it he expected what was there and like he just felt entitled to what he kind of got and for i guess myself and jack who just lived in a van and paid our way and did all this hardship and then to see someone come in and be a junior and have a mechanic have everything paid for and then you just don't get an understanding of how good you actually got it and it's funny now how Nikki's obviously gone to the other side now being a privateer and driving around in a van and and being in that situation I think it's funny now like he's he's learnt backwards he's 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 had it and then he's had it taken away and he's just like oh shit like I I had it really, really good, but it's just, I almost think everyone's got to almost go through that semi hardship. I don't, I think that's, that's, it's almost like the initiation into world cup racing. And I feel like it's something that's almost getting taken away now with like, obviously 
I don't know if you read Eddie Masters little article about how obviously on the UCI is trying to, I guess, make it a bit more of a formal event. And then with obviously the 60 riders instead of 80 and all these things, it's almost cutting down the way of entering in. It's almost like you're a factory junior or you're a factory rider and that's kind of it. It's not really like a progression into it. No, I didn't see that. That's interesting now. Mm. Well, he just talks about how it's like, so it's just like the whole cutting it down. Like how far do we cut it down and is it actually better for the sport or sure. is it worse? But it's just like the whole thing, yeah. I feel like you just got to go through a bit of hardship before you actually enter into the, the big leagues. Um, another thing I was going to talk to you about, you're talking about before because you went on a little trip recently in your truck and I see you're, you've been going on a few camping things now. So you're just trying to get out more and I guess use the time because obviously you've been healing lately as well and there's not a whole heap through but you've been trying to get away a lot and I guess just, yeah, get back to nature and have a good time with everyone. Boo said you jumped on a slack line. The yeah, other it's. Dude, I, she sent me your video and I was like, oh my gosh, you're so good. Yeah. Boo um... and I, like a few weeks ago, we went in the afternoon and uh, yeah, I did, I think I did one pass down and it took yeah. me like 40 minutes to do. And I was like, right, that's me done. Like I was getting so frustrated, but I was very impressed by your slack line skills. Dude, keep, keep at it, man. Cause I've been doing it because it's like, it's one of the only things I can do because of obvious reasons. Um, yeah, I just put the slack line so low to the ground. Like, I'm not <laughs> falling off. <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, get, like, I'm, like, the, the amount of strength I've built in my legs is, like, I went for a run yesterday, and um, I ran eight, eight Ks, and it's the first run I've done in, in months and months, and my legs just felt so springy. And then at the end, I just did, like, a 100-meter sprint just to finish. And I've never felt so springy. Like, I've never felt like I was, like – you know, when you have like you're running, you obviously have a harsh impact of like your feet. I was just like, I literally felt like I was floating. And I guess all those like obviously little muscles that are never engaged. It's just, everything's firing so much better. Like I did a, um, a pistol squat on it yesterday, like all the way ass to the, the slack no line way. And, and back up. And I was just like, a week ago, that was impossible. Like I'd get low and it's all, the, my leg would just shake and all the stabilizers wouldn't be in, um, wouldn't be yeah, working yeah. together. And now to be able to do that, man, I'm just like, holy shit. Like, and obviously when you're riding a bike, that's like all those little muscles need to be firing. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of it, man. I think it's really good, especially if you're recovering to build strength back in um, like, like knees, ankles, legs, like everything like that. Cause it's no tearing. It's just like all engaging. So I'm a big For slack sure. line. I'm a big slack line advocate. I was, man. I was very impressed, but yeah, I, uh, so I got my truck, December last year um and uh I, I had it I've had a Tacoma before that um well before my van and uh but it wasn't four-wheel drive so it's the first time I've ever had a four-wheel drive vehicle and mm. um I've just fallen in love with uh I guess overlanding you could say uh truck camping four-wheeling that sort of thing um it's just been unreal like getting getting to take my truck and just go explore is is incredible um getting to kind of learn how to to properly off-road and safely off-road um has been really fun and it's just like such an amazing experience especially like i mean you've been to my house you stayed here like it's there's so much going on in orange county um as far as development and people and i love it like i'll be here for the rest of my life but being able to go like up to the sierras and just experience nature in its untapped form, like seeing these things. It's like, this is the natural beauty. Like there's no mm -hmm. development here or anything. Like it's, it's so refreshing. And I get like, I get so much contentment from it. I just feel mm -hmm. like, you know, like my greed is gone and I'm just like, so in the moment and so happy to be there. And like mm -hmm. this last weekend was one of the best trips ever. Like had just had a solid group of guys got to do a bit of, um, a bit of, uh four wheeling and uh had some like both campsites were amazing like awesome views sunrises were so sick both days and then like um when we went off-roading like got like drove up into the storms like got to drive in the snow like it, it was so much fun so it's just like it it, it kind of just goes back to like i love having things that i'm passionate about outside of racing um and that's definitely one of the uh one of the biggest ones for sure like even even before i did my hand like my plan already was you know in the few weeks off that we got like i'm gonna try and camp as much as i can so i'm glad that i was um able to do that because 
I mean, as you know, like you always say like, oh, I want to do this, I want to do this. And then it's easy to kind of just like put it, put it aside. But um, yeah, the, the whole overlanding thing is definitely something of um, fallen in love with. And it's funny because it's like, you know, you do those things and you like, you do it and you're like, all right, like I'm good for a while type thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I'm literally driving home from the trip and I'm like, oh, I wonder when I can get out next. Like, mm. it's so much fun. Well, like that, like you said before, when you're out there, you have like your greed goes, you're like understanding of everything. And like, it kind of puts things in perspective and you kind of just like, oh, you don't need that much. Like when you're in the actual in nature and being in that moment, you just like, we just need these feelings of like pure beauty and just being around good people. And it's just like, it, it, I think you want to go back to that because then when we come back to, I guess, what our former reality and you've got Instagram and you've got all these things and products and consuming, it's just like you're in this overdrive of like, you, you feel like you need to want stuff or you need things where then you're out there, you're like, I don't need anything. Everything's here. And then you have that connection with where you are and what you're doing. And it's just like, oh, this is it. This is, this is, this is, this is really good. <laughs> but yeah, that, yeah, it's really cool. And like, um, my, uh, boo that's my girlfriend for everyone that's listening um she's she's super uh she's super into camping as well so like it's been really cool for us to go and and take bubba with us um and just uh like he he has a great time when he goes and just like get to make all these experiences um yeah i'm very thankful for it for sure no no it's good to say i was gonna say you're gonna come on another road trip when when you come back to oz <laughs> Jump back in the van. She's been modified. We can put, we've actually got bunk beds while well, we can make bunk beds in there now. So bunk beds. Well, I've lifted the bed up. It's pretty high. So we can hundred percent put a bed underneath. Yeah. Let's go. Go on another trip. And I'm also, I've, um, I put an offer in a house yesterday in Bright Chuck. So I might have a new, new pad to chill at, which is around where I am now, which would be cool. No way. Good job. Congrats. Yeah. So it's going to be like more of, you know, like a riding place i guess you'd say so a bit more i don't know beneficial for actually tra training reasons and whatnot there's no beach but we've got some nice mountains and good good, uh, good i'm definitely uh i'm definitely feeling very depleted of my australian experience so i'm looking forward to getting back there as soon as possible <laughs> coming back um another thing you know i was saying before how when you go out to nature and you just feel like there's more of a connection and the greed and everything goes that was i was going to go into we talked the other day about like more sustainable um living and like products and i guess through sponsors and stuff and i know vulcan's a big advocate of that and they are obviously people that support you but are you feeling now especially when you go and do something like that and then you come back and you see i guess all this waste and just just kind of crap like just even packaging and all this stuff especially what we get from certain sponsors or certain people just and it just seems so wasteful like I don't, I'm not, I'm not meaning to re like, this is, this is completely my bias, but just say like the other day, um, before worlds or world cup finals, I think Lloyd got a new pair of um, goggles and he was just taking them out of the box and like showing people what he got. And I couldn't help, but just see like, he's got like obviously a pair of goggles, which is cool. But in the box, it was just like cardboard plastic, this massive, like it looked really cool, but it was just, it just seemed so wasteful. It's like, sweet, you take your goggles out and then you've just got all this, waste like it was literally a, a huge like almost like a big shoe box and it was really nicely made and cool but it's just like i don't know just the part of me now looks at that i'm just like you could do that you could make that same thing in such a nicer more sustainable way and have way less waste instead of just having sweet you've got this little pair of goggles and a huge box that then just gets thrown away and i just feel like with obviously Volcom, they're doing more um renewable stuff and like reusing materials and stuff and i know you're a big advocate of that i'm just wondering like how you feel about that or like you want to push that more or see more of that happen especially in our industry yeah for sure i'm, I'm very thankful to uh be partnered with Volcom, and they're so progressive with um trying to to limit their uh their impact and you know their implementing all these ways with their denim to uh, save a ridiculous amount of water, you know, using organic cotton, making all a lot as m most of their stuff as possible with um, recycled fabric, that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's really cool to be partnered with people that kind of have the same ideas as you. Um, and I think kind of what we were talking about the other day, like I think that a lot of the industry is like on the verge of you know making that that turn as far as like let's be as sustainable as possible mm -hmm. um but yeah like you said i feel like there's there's tons of things you know across the board um 
lots of packaging that seems pretty unnecessary. And um, I think, uh, like I said, I think a lot of companies are probably going to be making that change here soon. And I hope so because mm -hmm. um, uh, sustainability has definitely been something that I've uh, grown very passionate about. So um, it's funny once your, uh, eye, your eyes are open to see, like I said, like normally I'd say that like that, goggle box and like that. And I was like, yep, that's just really cool. But now I just look at it in a completely different light. And if I see a company that's sustainable and like actually making an effort, that that's so much more attractive to me now. That's what I want to invest my money in. Cause it's, it's not just like you get something cool. It's like you're helping the earth, which is like, and that goes back to the whole connection with everything and with the whole gold thing. It's like, well, I feel connected to this. I'm helping myself by doing this at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I mean, it's hard for us to sit here because we're not dealing with the production side of everything, you know, so we don't know what's going on in the factories, but um, it's like, it seems like it would be pretty simple for, you know, swap out all the plastic bagging and packaging, just send it and, um, you know, post consumer waste or uh, mm. cardboard, um, just cardboard boxes with no packaging inside mm. of it or paper bags or something that's more sustainable. Um, mm. But I think as you can see, like it's popping up all across the board, like, companies are starting to to notice it because it's something that needs to get dealt with um otherwise we're just going to do irreversible damage um mm -hmm. fortunately you know we are in that time where we can do something about it and and help um you know reverse all of the damage that i don't not all of it um but reverse a lot of the damage that we've done um but it's definitely definitely something that i don't know what the answer is and i'm not educated enough to you know really speak on it um mm. but uh, it's something definitely needs to happen for sure mm. but i think that's the whole thing is more like you do you feel like you've kind of woken up to it like within the year or two that's kind of when like you've kind of got more uh, engaged with it i guess you'd say and i think yeah, that's for sure mm. and i think that's obviously the same with myself and i think again with like the pushing that direction to um younger kids to be like okay well sweet you want the shiny goggles or you want the shiny whatever it is but i'm like if you can push kids towards someone like that but is sustainable like that's the thing like as cl like cliche is it, like they're the future so if you can put into their heads to be more sustainable and be but use better products and, and not waste so much stuff because like with that's an, like with our industry like it's like sometimes you'll get stuff and it'll just be like i have like bins full of plastic and just just crap that's just like it's so it's so wasteful it's like yeah it looks cool in your packaging because you set it up so it's like you've got this one little part and it's in a huge cardboard box with heaps of plastic and shiny stuff and like sweet like that looks cool but now that's all going in the bin and i just i, I just like it, it just kills me out like to to be that wasteful with stuff that like it just doesn't have to be but it's yeah mm. definitely a thing that's changing for in sure and, and and it is there is there is easy ways to do it. Like for example, like the t-shirts that Volcom will send that, that is wrapped in a plastic bag. Um, they did, they started doing a thing where they just folded the t-shirt once more. So that way the plastic bag that it's in is way smaller. So mm. if you do, you know, that little bag, like compared to the normal bag, doesn't make much of a change, but then you do that across millions of units. Like mm. it, it, it adds up so much. Um, mm. And yeah, like you said, like it might not look as nice when you pull it out of the thing because it's folded once more, but it, yeah. it's still just as high quality of a t-shirt and you're going to love it just as much. Um, mm. But yeah, it's stuff that stuff that's repairable, um, high quality stuff that's going to last. That's mm. definitely, that's that, like you said, like that's what I think is cool now. Mm. Stuff that's going to last and you can fix and um, does its job very well so that you don't need to go buy, you know, four more of the same thing because it doesn't last very long. Yeah. And that's even, you were saying, um, Patagonia has been doing like really pushing that kind of stuff as well. Now they would just do repairs and then sell the repairs, for like a bit cheaper or, and, and push that kind of side of things as well, which I think is just like that to me. I'm like, well, now I want to buy that just because of that reason before you even see what they're like, the, the products they're pushing, just the idea of reusing stuff like that. I'm just like, that's cool. I want to be a part of that, like that brand, that company. For sure. And it's, it's, I mean, and I'm just as guilty of it as the next person, like we, as consumers, like, especially with society these days, like you just want, you just want the next best thing. You, mm. you just always in this state of wanting. Um, mm. And it's super easy to just consume without thinking about, you know, the, 
if you take this take this coffee mug for example like the resources it takes to make that one thing like it's so easy to just not even think about it mm -hmm. and just keep consuming um so th the most sustainable thing other than not purchasing something is getting something secondhand, secondhand. Or, do you think yeah. do you think it's crazy as well that like we all know this, that we shouldn't be doing it or consuming that. And then it's funny when you go back to nature and have that connection, it just all kind of seems to wash away in a certain sense. And you're just like, oh, this is what I need. And it's that weird thing, like, you know, it's happening, you know how to fix it, but then it's just like, you've still got to play the game, which is just normal life with. Yeah, for sure. And even it's like, there'll be this whatever, like, there'll be this one thing that you've just been like thinking about, like, oh, I just want it, I want it. And then even in that, you're like, I know I don't need this. Like I'm buying this for no reason. Mm. And then you're like, I'm not going to get any fulfillment out of it. And sure enough, you, like you said, you just play the game anyways, you get it. And then the result is exactly what you knew it was going to be like. It, mm. It's going to, the, the excitement wears off real quick and then mm. that's it. So mm. it's funny like how you just keep playing this game that you know, but it's like when you when you order something and it's coming in the mail and every day you're checking the tracking number and you're checking the mail and you're so excited yeah. and then you get it two days later it's on the ground it's it's yeah, for it's, sure and i'm not i don't want people thinking that i'm like some activist or i'm perfect like because i'm definitely not yeah. like i like i said i'm just as guilty as the next person but it's been really cool like last year and then uh especially over covid like it's it's definitely something that i've grown to become uh very passionate about well, that's the thing. It's just all steps, man. Like, that's the thing. It's we're, like, we're not all perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm still a consumer, but it's just like little things. Like sometimes like I won't buy like, so, like I'll buy something that's a bit more sustainable or I won't buy something because there's no point or I'll really think about it. But like, do I really need that? And that's like you said, like the smaller bags is just an example of like one little thing, but over a massive, like millions of units of it will make a difference. But it's like one little change not buying something that you know has just got shitty packaging or like eating from a certain place or like buying something. it's like but if everyone does it it's a massive wave and it's a, it's a massive change i think that's what's happening now like i think with this whole whole COVID thing because i look at it as like COVID's just been a time for i guess the, the planet and people just to to rest and learn because i know i've learned a whole heap and every time i talk to someone it's just like yeah i had this time to actually look in myself and see what i wanted to do and who i wanted to be and about maybe helping the planet or helping themselves or helping a friend and it's just like everyone kind of just hit the reset button or the pause button and went hey let's take a deep breath let's be in our in our own thoughts let's see how we actually feel and let's actually go from there and i've i went into this hate like all oh, not happy about it world cups got cancelled didn't want to be just just it was over everything and now i look back at it as like i wouldn't change it for the world if you could take me back to portugal and said look knowing what i know now and say do you, would you want to go down this covid path or would you want to run the year out like you would normally run it out i would go down the covid path and it comes back to that pain teacher and that like the, like everything because i know now going to next year i've learned more this year than i would have if i just did another year of what i would normally do and i'm so grateful for that and then going to next year i'm just like fuck i've got some got some got some logs on the fire ready to burn for 2021 so i think it's just like yeah, looking at it like that is like fuck this is yeah it's gonna be good but like i think it's just yeah this was a time of growth and just a just a rest like the, the planet just got to take a deep breath and go fuck we're not we're not we're not doing all this consuming and we're not doing all this fucking damage just for a little bit and people can educate themselves a bit more thoroughly because even talking to yourself like that was one of the, like i talked to you and i felt like you kind of had a bit of a, a change in like your whole demeanor and what you saw importance to and whatnot and i know i did the same and chatting to a few other people it just seems like that's the kind of trend that's happened which is which is really cool to see for sure and it's i mean like i said like in our phone call a few weeks ago i've through covid like i've been such a bookworm i've been reading so much and um yeah learning a bit about sustainability it's just like it, it's really cool and i'm like i said i'm very thankful to be with people that support the same ideas as me um even trek they did a they did a campaign it's called go by bike and they're you know asking people to ride their bike to work or to what, whatever little drive you would do that you would normally just take your car if you're going to the grocery store to grab whatever you know ride your bike and mm -hmm. and um help limit your impact and it's cool that there are there is a lot of hope and there's so many companies that are being so progressive about it i think um 
I think we're on that verge where there's a lot, a lot of change that's going to happen very soon. Hmm. But it's, I've going back to what you said, like, I think so many people have grown and learned so much throughout COVID um, hmm. that lots of people will be very thankful for the, for the end result and, and how a whole new, um, a whole new view on life uh, heading hmm. into next year. Hmm. I listened to a podcast with a guy and he, um, he got sent to jail. I think it was for a murder or something that he didn't commit. And he got, um, he got, he was going to get the death penalty and he just accepted that I'm going to die. It wasn't for something I did, but what am I going to do? Like, and he just had this, I guess, realization of just, okay, well, this is going to happen. I might as well just but like, just kind of really looking within himself. And he was like, obviously isolated for a while, but leading up to when it was going to happen. And then, he got acquitted or whatever, or they found out it wasn't actually him through evidence or whatever. And then he got released, but he was still in there for like a few years or something. And he looks back and he's just like, it's the best thing that's ever happened to him because he just got put in this state of just like, well, you're going to die, which obviously we're all going to die. We're all going to die, but he just got it obviously sped up, but he accepted that, accepted the whole death thing and accepted that it was for something he didn't do, but he can't change that. And he's just like, he just this really soft spoken, just um, genuine person that just like, sees the benefit of actually having that time to himself and that really intense, I guess, learning period of just what could, what could possibly happen. Have you gone off chuckles? All right. After some te technical difficulty, we're back. <laughs> um, and what we <laughs> um, oh, it's definitely echoey now. Oh no, it's not too bad. Um, what are we saying, Chuckles? We should wrap, wrap this. How long have we been going for? We got a couple. Of, we got a couple of hours in the book. Two hours. Oh, I'm pumped. I haven't done one of these things in ages. I want to start doing them again and actually, yeah, picking it back up. It has, it has been a while. People want to hear you, Don. Oh, I just like chat with people. It's it's definitely like that's one thing. Like I don't get when pe people get like annoyed at well not annoyed but like they just like cast their opinions at people doing a podcast like I, I guess obviously you've got your own opinion and you can say what you want but like dude i'm just doing this for me like a hundred percent like i just want to i just want i just want to um chat with my friends and have like have a connection with them and learn things that i wouldn't have before and and then you put it out there for free but you get these people just like just throw shit at it i guess or just like put it down in certain ways like obviously a lot of people build it up but then you get some people that just put it down i'm like you're not paying for this it's just me and my friend having a chat you're just the fly on the wall like just be the fly on the wall <laughs> enjoy it or don't listen. enjoy it or don't listen to it kind of thing but i guess no, um it's we always have good chats when we when we call so no. i'm i'm stoked that we were able to make it happen because we've been talking about it for a while no, it's pump. We, 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 where we started, we're back, full circle. Back to not recording to now, now actually recording them. <laughs> uh, Technical difficulties. All right. Um, all right, man. Well, I'll, I'll just stop the recording and it was a little chat to you, man. But um, I'll, I'll pause as we keep this going. I'll just, I'll just pause now. The people, if you, want to, if you want to thank anyone before we go and just um, give a shout out or whatnot before we, before we sign off. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks to the team for sure. Uh, Trek Factory Racing, you guys are amazing. I'm very, very blessed to be a part of such a um, such a professional and fun team. Um, I'm very thankful for them backing me and uh, the support that they give me. Um, thanks, my my family is amazing. I'm so blessed to uh, have people that love me so much. Um, my girlfriend and and uh, yeah, thanks to all my friends as well. Everyone, I'm so thankful to have such an amazing um, group of people around me and. Uh, Thanks for having, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. While we're here, man. While we're here. All right. Charlie Harrison, everybody. I'll see if I can stop this thing now. <laughs>